What did you guys think of the adverts that you got on the tables? If, I don't think, did you get a paid? Sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, any points on the adverts and what they, what they kind of say, how they speak to you? All suddenly goes quiet. Now I know you're talking before, unless you're just chatting about your day. Oh, you were thinking about who's on the rich list? Yeah. Any other points on the adverts and how they speak to us? What makes adverts stand out and how they work? It took us a while to work these ones out. Have you got, have everyone got the same ones? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the KFC and the Audi ones, yeah. So the, um, Alan was pointing out the advert, the KFC and the burger-shaped hole in the centre of the child. Sounds way creepier. Um, the idea that the one thing missing from this child is a KFC burger, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, and the car advert, I thought that one was quite clever. It was saying it's got like a, the family tree, the Audi family tree dating back to their first car. Yeah. And then the fat cat. Who's the fat cat? Yes, it's Simon Cowell, apparently on the Sunday Times Rich List. As a, yeah. 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 So they rely on a little bit of earthly knowledge. Um, yeah. <laughs> Apparently they made us some of the best billboard adverts, according to the poll from 2015. Um, but yeah, it was an opening thing to kind of get you thinking about um, the difference between earthly wisdom and spiritual wisdom, um, in line with the passage that we've got today, which is taken from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. Um, and a kind of bit of context for, for this letter. It's the first letter to Corinth, um, written by Paul. And according to this one, it was written around AD 55. I imagine that's hard to kind of pinpoint an exact date. Um, and from the letter, it hints that the church, the city of Corinth, um, and its church were having a lot of disagreements um, over various different things, um, morality, and how to fit in as Christians in, in an immoral world. And to me, that was quite relatable, um, the issue of how do we be the church in a world that often doesn't want to hear and often asks for exact opposite of that message. Um, so Paul's letter is full of both um, helpful, practical tips on being, being that light and that voice, but also quite a lot of rebuking on how not to be that voice. Um, but this passage today um, is up on the slide. And I'm going to read it through with you. This is from the um, New Living Translation. And it's just the whole chapter of chapter 2. And Paul writes, When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I'd forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so that you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. 
But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. So what stood out to me when I read that passage was this split, this um, separation between earthly wisdom, what the world teaches us, and what God teaches us, what the Spirit teaches us. And um, I thought we could do as a kind of discussion, if we split the room in half, and one half discusses what earthly wisdom would be um, in the context maybe of our daily lives or in, the, in this passage, and the other half discusses spiritual godly wisdom so if we kind of split here and these two tables you discuss what earthly wisdom is according to that passage and your lies and this kind of side does um godly wisdom and then we'll come back together in a second okay it looks like looks like it'd be a good time to kind of draw back together Um, and try and establish what earthly and spiritual wisdom are. Um, So in terms of earthly wisdom, um, I know for a fact that you guys had some good points because I was sat here and I heard them. Um, But yes, if you've got anything that you want to share on earthly wisdom. I'd say it's looking after number one and get what you can. That seems to be the wisdom of the age. Yeah, and that's what struck to me is this wisdom of um, individualism. As long as I'm doing all right, little old me, then it doesn't matter. And if we all act that way, then surely the world's going to be okay. But it doesn't seem to work that way. Yeah, but that's not... No. Yeah, that, yeah, which is a really good point that we say, you know, like, oh, if I live a good life, then it's all okay. And if we all do that, then the world will be all right. But actually, in reality, trying to do it on your own just doesn't really work. Um, that we don't just live a good life and it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Yeah, so individualism and the trappings of that. Are there any other points on what earthly wisdom is? They have the answers. They have a wisdom of a sort in their eyes. They make massive decisions based on what they know, and I'm sure at the time it might be well-meaning, but they have their own hidden agendas. So, I mean, that is just, it just brings total confusion, doesn't it, really? Yeah, confusion over politicians and people in power telling us what is right and what is wrong. Yeah, and that often they are only seeing a very small viewpoint that is blinkered by their own um, biases and needs. Um, yeah, so earthly wisdom all in all is not, I liked Gary's point that he said that it's not wisdom, it's... It's the exact opposite, it's usually, but it's made up, tied up to look this way, that it is wisdom. But in reality, it's, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah, it would, it would. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And it's more the kind of earthly worldview, isn't it, than any real wisdom. Um, how about spiritual wisdom? What, what was discussed over this side of the room? I think we were saying that godly wisdom is kind of back to front to everything that we're taught by the world. And um, I can't remember what else was said. What else did we say? God's got the big picture. Oh, yeah. That, um, and it, we were reminded of the um, passage where they're choosing the kings and David is the weakest and it says man looks at the outward appearance but God looks at the heart. So God sees everything. Whereas we can only make judgments on what we see and know. But God can give us the bigger picture. Yeah. Which I think exactly parallels what Jane was saying, that, um, that politicians and our world, like worldview that's shaped by human beings only sees what we as human beings see, where God sees way, way more. So when we're in tune with his plan, then we see way, way more and see beyond the surface of things. Are there any other points on spiritual wisdom as well? Okay, we're going to draw it together. The thing that stood out to me is that um, often when um, 
when I, when I hear from God. Or when, when I was trying to get to grips with what faith was and believing in God was, um, and particularly the God in the Bible, it always struck me how much, how much it is an exact opposite of what the world taught me. And trying to remove all those trappings of the world to try and get in line with him, I found really, really difficult, really hard, because I was very much a part of the world. Um, I was at university, and I was being taught... Uh, I was studying politics. So, funnily enough, a lot of it was very much teaching you the world view, where they're like, you're learning to question it, but actually you're just, you're just learning the world view. Um, and learning this view that there is no single truth, there is no one truth, um, and that any viewpoint is valid as long as you can kind of back it up. But you can't force that on anyone else because that's just your world view and that no one else can understand it and all this kind of silliness um, that I was trying to get my head around. And then I started to go to the church and they were like, There's, there was this guy who came down and he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And trying to explain that to... To my friends who were who were still um, studying politics, still following this viewpoint, saying, "Well, actually, no. I think I think I found the truth. Um, and it's really, really good truth. It's a really wonderful truth um, that that God lived and He breathed and He came down on earth and He died for us and He came back to life and we are free of these trappings of the world if we want to be." Um, and I can remember going in um, to my lecturer and and you know. And, and he was, like, explaining all these, these ideas of postmodernism. And I was like, yeah, but, but I believe in this truth. And I don't believe this is just a truth for me. I think this is a truth for the world. And I think it's a wonderful truth that we all need to hear. And him just completely being like, this, this is rubbish. You're just rubbish. Um, I'm like, oh, okay. Well, all right. I'm happy. And right. Um, but yeah, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? That trying to, to explain it to others, because it's such a topsy-turvy um, view on the world, means that often people don't take it in. It's very hard to explain it in, in earthly words. And that actually, what's a real blessing to understand for me was that actually I, I can't explain it on my own. Um, and God never expects me to be able to explain it on my own. That there are no earthly wisdom ways of explaining to my lecturer that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that I didn't need to because, because that's God's plan. That's that the Holy Spirit will speak through me. Um, and I fully believe that, that he did and he will. And that if I keep praying for my lecturer, then, then things can change. Um, and that even, even though he is so well and truly stuck into a worldview that even he can be saved and fully understand just what Jesus did for him. Um, and that was my struggle. And I imagine each of us has a person that we pray for, um, possibly numerous, I know I do, that we pray for who aren't Christian and who of a different viewpoint. Um, and how hard it is to, to talk to them about our faith. Um, and that was kind of where my mind went with it, in that Paul chooses um, to be very plain and very honest about um, what he believes and why, and like how he spoke to the church. He says, I'm not going to use wise words because I don't think you need that and I don't think it's going to work for you. I come um, with a very simple message of Jesus. And I thought it would be good to kind of discuss how we, as Christians, um, have come with that very simple message and discuss openly and honestly about times when it might not have worked or when... Or we don't think it felt it went well. Or times when we did. And just sharing the joys and sorrows of, um, of speaking to others about our faith. And from there I've got another few points. But yeah. So yeah, so if you want to kind of uh, discuss in your groups times when you've tried um, to tell others about your faith. And either it's failed or it hasn't failed or failed i.e being that we don't really see because we don't really know what happened after we left um yeah history book your lecture saying you know he believed in history but this is history and yeah and uh, god has tried to show us the way all the time always yeah that's a, yeah it's a really good point um my, my lecturer was, um, was a history lecturer. Um, 
so he'd be like, yeah, but no, but history has proved that it's wrong. But actually, yeah, this, this book, this book that we read is history, um, evident history. But to him, that wasn't, that's, it's not because, because the message that's behind it, that if he had to accept that the things in the Bible happened, then he'd also have to, to consider at least that if Jesus did exist and he did do what he said he did, then he's either mad or, or he's the son of God. And yeah. And so it's often, it's a, it's a topic that's avoided, isn't it? But yeah. That's the reality. Um, We are running low on time, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, And I think my point overall is this, is that Christianity in itself is not against rational thinking, against, um, you don't have to, in terms of, you don't have to throw away your brain to be a Christian. But we cannot explain or persuade people to be Christian in earthly words, and therefore it can often look irrational from the outside. The reality is that we need the Holy Spirit. We need her to speak through us. And often um, it's not in the words that we say, but in the choices and the actions that we make around people. Um, one case I had of this was when I was, uh, when I was at university again, um, I was really shocked by um, the kind of alcohol culture that's part of university. Um, and one night I was, um, I was still a very new Christian and I decided uh, uh, to pray into that. And I felt God kind of telling me, you know, you're still part of that culture right now. I was like, oh, yeah, I yeah. am. So I, from that moment, stopped drinking. I, I was like, um, which was a very tricky thing to then explain on the next night out. Like, oh, well, you haven't got a usual drink. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm like, why? And I'm like, um, God told me not to. <laughs> being like, what? Um, are you insane? No, um, but I don't like who I become when I'm drunk. And I don't like who we all become when we're drunk. Because it just seems silly to me that to be able to have a good night out, we have to, to, have to get inebriated um, that to be able for us to have a, a really close conversation, we have, to, we have to have had beer. Just didn't quite make sense. So I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm like, I'll, I'll still come out with you guys. Um, but if there's bits that I don't like, I'm just going to go. Um, I'm like, All right, maybe to it. And actually, they were incredibly um, supportive of it. And I still had a great university time. I'd still go out with them. Um, but I'd choose not to drink. And I'd choose not to do all the other stuff that goes with it. And I had some amazing conversations with people um, in a club. Um, And often um, it got to a point where, like about a year in, that um, a friend of mine who was one of those that I used to get really, really drunk with, he came up and he was like, oh, I'm in a really, like, really tough place right now. Um, And um, he lost his parents recently. And he was like, I know you're a Christian because because that's why you don't drink, isn't it? I was like, yeah. Uh, Will you pray for me? Okay. And he'd been touched not by my words, not because I've been like, well, Jesus loves you um, and you should know this, but by the actions that I'd chosen to make. Um, and to me, that was a time when I was like, oh, okay. All right. Thank you, God. Not because you changed my life, but because you helped me change that person's life just a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think that's my kind of message that it's also the thing where if, if faith could be explained, if we could use earthly wisdom to explain god then he wouldn't be god if we like if our minds could could fully point by point explain faith exactly then that wouldn't be a mystery it wouldn't be wouldn't be the creator of the universe if we could fully understand that in that we can't fully understand the universe right now science keeps changing how we explain all these details so how much more amazing is its creator and therefore how much harder it is to get our heads around him that therefore we can't so we don't need to explain him in that way but we can choose to explain him through our actions and just through those little little moments. Um, so on that point, I want to finish. And, um, and if you'd like to kind of silently pray, um, then feel free to. Um, and I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to speak through us um, and to touch the things that might have been on our heart.
Like, or is there someone else who's supposed to be doing praying? There's no one else. In, have you got prayers planned? No. Okay. Good. All right. I suddenly thought, oh, if I just cut into someone else's, they've got a grand prayer idea planned. No. Okay. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you for the freedom that it is that we don't have to um, to speak, but you do. And that you choose to freely through us. And I ask for a fresh anointing on us um, now and into our lives, that when we leave here, we carry on being your voice. May that not be a daunting, but a, a freeing, freeing feeling 